right. Uh, so today, actually, we're going to start uh, this next week to go slowly and uh, revisit almost everything we have done in this course in the context of regression. So if things have not clicked, you know, you know nothing, uh, you have another opportunity to actually pick it up, okay? So in some sense, we have been way more advanced than what uh, this essential topic requires. So hopefully when we go through this, uh, it will not uh, uh, be as bad. All right, now before I do this, uh, there was an example on uh, hierarchical Bayesian models from uh, last Friday's lecture. So I want to, to go back to that and spend maybe 10 minutes to do that example. And if I can locate the TAs, I'm going to ask them to give them to you as a homework as well, OK? Or something of uh, this origin. So remember, the whole idea, right, is we have a model that has parameters theta. and. Uh, we are putting another prior on theta, and that uh, prior has uh, some new parameters, hyperparameters, that we call the meta. The idea is, by putting a prior on the prior, we're diminishing the effect of, of the parameters uh, in, in uh, the uh, inference we do. And uh, not only that, uh, there's some practical aspects that we will see again in this example. But also, what is important is, as you keep going down in the hierarchy, actually you can fix some of the parameters to point estimates and still be fully Bayesian. So you will not be able to fix, uh, let's say, the parameters theta using uh, an MLE or a map estimate, but somehow you will be able to fix the hyperparameter theta to a point estimate. Okay? And uh, so this table basically summarizes everything you need to know. It's an extremely essential table. So the first line is the MLE estimate, maximizing the likelihood. Uh, the second is maximizing the posterior. So here you don't even bother about eta, you know. And uh, the third, which is the example, one of the examples we did is we use uh, the evidence and we maximize the evidence to compute a point estimate for eta. And the evidence is uh, given by what you see here. It's really the marginal likelihood is the probability of the data, if you like, okay, where all the parameters theta have been integrated out, but we kept eta as a variable, right? So we write basically the evidence as a function of eta, and then we maximize it, and we compute a point est estimate, and then in the remaining of the inference calculations, we use that point estimate, okay? Uh, so I'm going to do an example of, of this today, and actually we will see another example in the context of regression as well. Uh, if you want to put a prior on the parameter theta, effectively you're going to maximize, this is the marginal likelihood times the prior, all right? There's no theta here, theta has been integrated out, okay? Uh, so, you, uh, so this is another uh, uh, calculation you can do. And eventually, if you want, you can be fully Bayesian where you compute the posterior of theta and eta. Okay? Uh, so this would be very complicated to do. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one example uh, that involves this empirical Bayes formulation because it's sort of standard for uh, Bayesian analysis. Uh, and, and it also gives an intuition why you need hierarchical uh, Bayesian models. So we did one example with... Uh, I believe it was with cancer rates or something like that in different cities on Friday. So let me do another example that involves Gaussian models. So we have uh, 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 J schools, uh, J from 1 to D. Um, and we're looking at uh, students basically taking a certain class in these uh, uh, schools. Uh, and uh, uh, each school has uh, NJ students in the class, right? And uh, so I is the student, J is the school. And uh, so what we want to do is, we want to estimate the mean score uh, for each school for that particular class, okay? So imagine that you know students take uh, statistics course at Notre Dame, at Purdue, etc., and uh, our class is a minimalist class, as NJ going to zero, 
uh, at Purdue, I'm sure MJ is 100, okay, plus, all right? But somehow, we need to estimate what is the mean grade in the class uh, for each school. And as we explained last time, you can actually just work for each school separately, right? You can uh, do an MLE estimate for Notre Dame, an MLE estimate, let's say, or a map estimate for Purdue, etc. But how about if you have a case where the classes are extremely small? Can you actually trust any inference if you have a sample of uh, 10 students? The answer is no. So what the idea here is, we're going to try to link the information between schools uh, so we can use information from a school with more students to do inference on a school with less students. And the way we do this is by linking all the parameters, the grades basically in each school uh, through uh, a, a, a prior that has the same hyperparameters for all theta j's. So the average grades of Purdue come from a Gaussian that has a mean mu and a variance tau square. The same is the case at uh, Notre Dame, at, you know, Indiana University, etc. So the idea here is now, because all of these parameters are linked through mu and tau square, you have no other means but to actually put all together to calculate the theta j's. Okay? So effectively, you are pulling resources from places that have uh, a big nj, so if you can do a better estimate for places where they have less number of students. All right, so the equation that you see on the bottom is basically the unnormalized posterior, okay, for given parameters um, uh, eta and sigma square, okay. Uh, I'm going to define all the variables. So eta is basically on my prior, these are the hyperparameters. I call eta to be mu and, uh, and uh, tau, uh, okay. And uh, the, this is, so I have uh, these schools, all right, and in each school I have NJ students, and I take that the grades follow a Gaussian, and these are IID samples, so the grades of each student follow a Gaussian with this mean and this variance, so sigma square is the variance in the grades uh, in each school, and I take the same sigma square, and actually to make the analysis simple, I'm taking here the noise to be constant, all right, known, so we don't, you know, we can concentrate on the mean, and then uh, the means are linked through this prior uh, that has parameters mu and tau square. Okay? You remember the posterior of the parameters theta, right? From Bayes' rule is the, literally is the likelihood times the prior, the likelihood times the prior is this joint. So this is the numerator in, in Bayes' rule. Okay? So this is what I call the unnormalized posterior. Okay? All right. Um, all right, so we are uh, all set up now. So uh, I'm going to use, uh, you know, without any derivation, I trust uh, uh, <coughs> that you can prove it, bless you, <coughs> you can bless you again, you can prove it, uh, uh, or trust that uh, this is actually correct. So here is, uh, if you look at, uh, at this likelihood, right, it involves uh, a product uh, for every D, a product over the students of these Gaussians, okay? Uh, student I from I1 to NJ, you can actually prove that this product here, all right, look at it again, you can prove that this product is actually equivalent to a Gaussian uh, that uh, is, uh, has a mean around theta J with a variance sigma J squared given by that, okay? And uh, where you have replaced all the grades of all the students with the uh, uh, with the sample mean. It sounds sort of a, uh, a, a complicated thing to prove, right? You had the pro the product of all of these Gaussians uh, centered around theta j with variance sigma square, <coughs> all right? So if you actually do the calculation, this is equivalent to substituting this product of all these Gaussians of xij using the sample mean. So this is a Gaussian uh, where the variable is the sample mean centered around theta j, but the variance becomes sigma squared over nj. 
trust me, it's just algebra, okay? Because it's really not the point that I want to convey today, all right? So take that product, you can show that it basically takes this form that you see here, where the only thing I want you to remember is xj bar is the sample mean for school j. So it's basically the average grade uh, for school j, okay? And, and I have done no assumptions, you know, uh, so effectively this calculation that I had here, this product here, I'm gonna substitute it with this product, okay? Now, um, I'm gonna jump a little bit ahead of, uh, uh, of the slides here. You remember I was telling you that when you use hyperparameters and hyperpriors, it is okay to actually fix the hyperparameters to a point estimate, okay? I'm going to show you how you fix them. But let's say we fix them. Uh, it's on, the derivation is on the next slide. And instead of using uh, uh, eta to be some uh, uh, random variable, I fix them to eta hat, which has you know, a mu uh, hat and a tau hat. Uh, the derivation is going to come on the next slide. But let's say somehow we maximize the evidence, and we will see what that means and we fix them to some point estimates. These equations at this point are irrelevant, but let's say that they are fixed parameters, okay? So the joint, um, uh, so the normalized posterior is the product of this Gaussian times this Gaussian from j equal one to d. And uh, so if you concentrate on the product of these two Gaussians, you can, uh, uh, either by closing the square, you remember the closing the square on theta j? If you multiply them and you accumulate the terms of theta j, you're gonna get a new Gaussian, okay? That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is actually to use uh, a formula that I gave you in an earlier lecture for, uh, for linear Gaussian systems. Because you notice here, x bar j is a function of theta j, all right? So it's uh, basically a linear function of theta j, where the linearity is one, and then you have uh, a theta j here, another Gaussian. So you can use actually the formulas for, for linear Gaussian systems. So one way or another, if you multiply those, you close the square, you can actually show that the product of these two Gaussians, it's actually another Gaussian, and here I give you the result, okay? And again, I carry these formulas, which don't mean anything at this point. What is important is that this bj, when you close the square, comes to be sigma j squared divided by sigma j squared plus tau hat squared, okay? I remind you sigma j squared is sigma squared over nj from the manipulation, basically, of the likelihood, okay? That's why there is an index j, because the number of students in every school changes. And tau hat is this hyperparameter that is fixed, and we will see how exactly we fix it on the next slide, okay? So, the unnormalized posterior is a product of all, all the schools of these Gaussians, all right? And you can see now, uh, the posterior on each parameter theta j is a Gaussian, set around this mean and with these variables. So before we philosophize now what uh, uh, is all this about, right? I appreciate, you know, appreciate the fact here that all the average grades in, over each school depend on the same parameters mu hat, okay, and tau hat. And those mu hat and tau hat, we will see they are calculated using the grades in all the schools. So we're sharing information over all the schools to actually estimate this mu hat and tau hat. So if in a school, again, you have very few students, uh, you're not gonna be getting a lousy estimate because you're pulling information from another bigger school uh, to do this estimation. All right, uh, so in the next slide, uh, it, it will discuss how you compute, how you fix these parameters, you know, and, and the idea again is we're going to fix them by maximizing the evidence, okay? Uh, so can you tell me what calculation I need to do to compute these two equations? So basically this is the anormalized, uh, the anormalized posterior. How do I get the evidence from that equation? What do I need to do in this equation? 
you remember the evidence is really the marginal likelihood where I have integrated all parameters theta out. And I only kept the hyperparameters, which is this mu and tau. So how, what do you need to do in this equation to get the marginal likelihood? What do we need to do to this equation? Remember, evidence is the probability of the data. So, you know, what do I need to do to get the probability of D here? <laughs> there is a theta there that uh, I don't like it. We have to integrate the theta out. We have to get rid of the theta. So what we need to do in this equation, right, for, and, and because of this factorization, we can do this for each term. We need to integrate theta j out. All right? So if you actually integrate its theta j out, okay, I, uh, you're getting, you know, again, these equations for linear Gaussian systems and all these nice formulas, you're actually getting another Gaussian. Literally, if you have this and you, you know, uh, this is, you remember I, I gave you these formulas that if you know p of x and you know p of y given x, you can reverse this and calculate p of y and p of x given y. So basically what this is, it is actually getting the marginal out of this, okay? So the marginal is this equation that you see here, okay? I'm not going to derive the formula. You can do the algebra if you don't believe me. When you do this and you integrate it at say, you get this, this Gaussian. So effectively, the evidence is the product over all schools of these Gaussians, okay? Remember, this is the sample mean over each school. This is uh, the unknown hyperparameters. This is the noise in the likelihood, and this is another hyperparameter. So now, uh, what we did, you notice this is the, this uh, marginal likelihood where the hyperparameters are kept there, but theta has been integrated now. This is very important, okay? So now we want to find uh, the optimal mu uh, and tau. So if you have Gaussians and you want to find, um, uh, you know, you want to maximize, uh, so this is a Gaussian, right? So it looks like um, uh, an MLE estimate actually, computing the mean and sigma squared plus tau squared doesn't, I mean, w isn't it the most obvious way to do it using an MLE estimate, right? I mean, you want to maximize the light. We have a Gaussian, uh, you have some observations, so these are your observations, and, uh, but it's over these schools and you want to find the mean and the variance. So what is the MLE estimate? The mean is the sample mean. Look at this now. You remember, this is the sample mean for school J, and what is this? It's the sample mean of the sample mean over all the schools. And this is the variance, and, and uh, so you substitute this with the empirical variance, and where the mean is obviously the sample mean, all right? These are the equations that I had before, okay? So the idea here is now, this hyperparameters mu and tau, are selected using all the information over all schools, okay? And with that said, uh, the posterior then for each average grade in every school depends on both mu hat and, and tau hat, and they are given by this very famous formula that goes you know, under the name of James Stein. Stein was a very famous statistician, has uh, done lots of work in, in mathematical statistics. So you may see this equ uh, equation in completely different settings when uh, you work with Gaussian uh, models and you use this uh, hierarchical modeling. So let's appreciate what this equation says, right? Let's take a case where the noise for school J, okay, uh, is very large, okay? Uh, so what happens when sigma J is very large? What happens to beta J? It becomes one, so if it becomes one, uh, this becomes one, so the mean of each theta j is pulled towards the pool mean. Because you know what? You cannot really do inference from school j 
the uncertainty is very high, it says, you know what, use the average value that comes from uh, putting all the data all together. Okay? And similarly, uh, if uh, beta j is uh, very small, all right, then you get uh, this equal to zero, and you can see here you get this, uh, the mean basically of theta j becomes actually the sample mean for school j. So if you have a lot of data in school j, that sample mean would be a good estimate, but not for schools that basically have very few students. Okay? Um, so in, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is various extensions on uh, uh, these calculations here. And, uh, uh, you know, if you search on the web or, you know, you look at statistics books, you will find sort of uh, uh, a lot of di uh, different interesting things. So, again, this hierarchical modeling is not just mathematics, right? It's not just a demonstration of maximizing this marginal uh, likelihood, but it is uh, uh, also uh, the only way to actually uh, uh, make inference in cases where you don't have in this case, you don't have enough information in one school, and you do uh, pooling to share information from uh, uh, other schools. So lots of applications on this, right? So be sure that uh, uh, you understand it, and be sure that you understand this concept of maximizing the evidence. That's why this technique is called the evidence um, uh, uh, approach, OK? Um, actually, I don't know, but I was driving today and listening at PBS and they were talking about, um, I, mean, I mean, I'm sure something political, they kept saying, no, it has to be based on evidence, evidence-based. And it's like, wow, this is what I'm gonna teach my students today, evidence-based, okay? The idea here is the evidence is the only thing you have, right? And whatever inference you do has to be based on that, not on uh, how you feel today. All right, uh, done. All right, so now we're uh, ready to go to simple problems. Okay, very simple. Let's see if I can, I will be able to go faster. So, uh, so obviously the, the, this uh, the major subject in, in uh, machine learning, right, is, is uh, to make inference out of data. And, um, um, and in this case, you see an example where uh, somebody, you know, you train a system with uh, handwritten digits of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And then the idea is, once you see the digit uh, from somebody who is uh, weird in writing, you can immediately say, oh, it's 0, or it's 1, okay? Uh, so that's one type of problem that uh, uh, I think we will do some classification problems uh, later in, in the semester. So that, you know, will be the type of... Uh, uh, calculations, machine learning would be interesting. Um, we already have seen, and we will discuss it today, the regression problem, right, where uh, is what's called supervised learning. Somebody gives you data uh, xi, yi, so input and output, and somehow you try now for a new x to predict what y is, okay? So that's called supervised learning problem, but in general, uh, we will have some uh, data, okay, uh, uh, and using this data, we are going to have to train the models before we are ready to do predictions. And this data set is called the training data set. So that's a new terminology for uh, the context of the class, right? So the training set is, uh, our, you know, every time we were saying, oh, given this data set, you know, compute these parameters. Well, that data set is called the training data set, okay? And in, uh, in a Bayesian setting, uh, if you have uh, any data, you have to use everything you have to make inference. In the classical statistics, people say, oh, no, keep some to, to, to do your magic and then use the rest to test things. In a Bayesian setting, if I have data, uh, that will be my training data to do everything, okay? You don't waste data, uh, you know, by saying I'm gonna use it for another purpose. Okay, uh, so this is the training data set, okay? And uh, now usually, let's say in the classification problem, right, uh, this, this uh, uh, training data set can be basically the digits, these this pixels literally, all right, these are pixelized images. And uh, maybe uh, if you're gonna do, let's say, supervised learning for these images, 
you're going to have a target vector for each uh, input. So maybe you, when you look at this image, you say, oh, this is 0. So the target, you say, it's, you know, this is 0. This is 1. This is 2. This is 3, etc. All right? So this is what's called the target vector t. OK? And uh, so in machine learning, basically, what we need to do is we need to learn a, a mapping from x to the target uh, vector t. OK? So once we train the system, in essence, we are going to produce some function y of x that for each x will tell us uh, what y is, and that y will be our target. Okay? So in the context of classification, will tell us what type of a digit is. In the case of regression, it will tell us what is the function value at that input uh, point. Um, all right? So um, I don't want to, to philosophize, right? But there's many other problems beyond this regression and classification. So, you know, lots of times, uh, if I have uh, data x that they are very high dimensional, I may want to visualize them in low dimensions. So really, I want to somehow reduce the dimensionality of the data. So this is an unsupervised learning problem. Or maybe what I want to do is, you know, if I have data, I want to see if I can separate them to different classes. Right? If I take the height of the students, you know, maybe there are two tall students, two short students, and nothing in between. So maybe two classes. Uh, so this is what's called unsupervised learning, okay? And uh, it's of significance, basically, to machine learning. And uh, I am not quite sure how much time I will have to cover it on this semester. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, when you look at the slides, there's a bunch of problems, right, that uh, are going to uh, be essential. Uh, all right. So let me start now with the, the regression thing, and we're going to go very slowly, pretending that you have um, not listened to any of my earlier lectures. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have uh, uh, n data points, x1, x2, xn. You can think this of uh, being one-dimensional. Uh, so this is scalar variables. Okay. And uh, I give you the corresponding um, uh, value of the function. And I call this uh, T1, Tn. Okay, I'm using the notation T here because I somehow this is the notation uh, out of Bishop's book, so I wanted to have some consistency um, with uh, what he is using. Okay, so uh, you can look, for example, here, right? These are the data points that I give you, the circles. So I give you the x and I tell you what the y is. Okay, now generally speaking, uh, these uh, values that I give you will be noisy values. They are not going to be the exact values, right? There will be maybe measurements of what happens at that x, okay? And, and we will, uh, uh, you know, see what the effect is of this as uh, we go along. All right, so we want somehow to fit uh, 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 some function to this data. And the easiest function is to fill some polynomial. And uh, this is the form that I'm going to use to do the fitting, OK? So we're going to model this function uh, of x, right? Uh, using this uh, monomials here, 1 x, x to the power m. And I'm going to write this explicitly in this form, OK? The coefficients w are unknown. Now, the, um, uh, an obvious way to do this, um, you know, you know this from hopefully from high school, is somehow to minimize the square error of at each uh, location of your input data, xn, right? You know what the target is. So you say, well, make the function to minimize this uh, square error. So basically, these uh, lines that you see here, if you sum them up, square, you try to minimize that. So effectively, you can think, right, that um, uh, this is uh, what the function will predict you at this point, but this is your actual data point, OK? So this error of y minus uh, tn uh, square will contribute to this error function. The same there, the same there. So this is, um, you know, uh, a quadratic error function, OK? Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, we use this because uh, it makes the algebra uh, good and the results basically uh, useful. But somehow the problem becomes an optimization problem. And you say, 
uh, if the y is given by this polynomial, uh, find the w's so that this error is minimized. And what you do is you take derivatives with respect to its w, and uh, it literally looks like a least squares problem, right? That's what it is. And uh, this is the linear system of equations you have to solve. Uh, uh, on the right-hand side, you have this vector capital D that is defined from both the input and the target values of the training data. And this metric A is defined basically by the, by the location x or your input uh, data to the power i plus j. Okay? Uh, do the algebra. This is what you get. Okay? A simple minimization problem. All right, uh, so uh, let's do this uh, fitting, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna use m equal to zero, which means uh, my uh, function approximation will be a constant, okay? So this is the constant, all right? So you fit it, this is how it looks like. And what you see this line here, it's actually the exact function that generated the data that I don't really know, but I'm plotting it on uh, the top of everything just to get a perspective of what's going on. So you can see the actual training data don't follow the generating function, which is sine of 2 pi x. All right? Um, so, uh, so obviously, uh, you know, here you're trying to make inference from noisy data, okay? This is gonna be very essential. So this is the solution if m equal to zero. Uh, this is the solution if m equal to one, again, you try to fill the uh, alpha, you know, w0 plus w1x. Uh, you try to fit this to the data using these squares. This is what you get. Uh, not very good. Uh, this is m equal to 3. Okay, starts so getting a little bit better. Uh, and now m equal to 9. So what happens when m equal to 9? So very high order polynomial. And what do you see now? I mean, isn't it the Dean school, you know, that the higher the better, the higher the order of a polynomial, the better, right? No? They didn't say that? I, I, I mean, I, 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 that's what I heard <laughs> from where I come, right? So what happens is, right, when m equal to 9, effectively you notice this polynomial passes through all the points. And this is bad because these points are uh, actually coming with noise. They don't represent the function itself. So actually what you're doing is you're fitting a polynomial to the noise of the data, not to the actual function. And you can see this if, uh, so, uh, uh, well, I'm gonna show you what it implies for the parameters, I think, on the next slide. But let's uh, do a calculation of a very important quantity. Uh, you remember we had this quadratic uh, error uh, the uh, training error that we minimize, all right? Uh, let me just go back and show to you uh, fast. So this is uh, the, the training error because these are my training uh, uh, data points, okay? But I can actually define a test error in a similar fashion where this x and t are uh, other values that I have not used for training, okay? So ex using exactly the same equation. So once we fit something, we can say, on these 10 points, how well do I fit, right? What is the test error? So uh, what this plot shows, and this is an extremely important plot, okay? It shows the training and the test error, okay? Uh, for various values of the polynomials m. And so what you see is both the training and the test error go down. And then you see a plateau where basically the errors have stabilized. And after, you know, some order of the polynomials, suddenly you see the test error going exponentially up. And of course, the training error goes to zero, literally, because you have fitted perfectly all the data points. But the test error blows up. And remember, we are not interested to do interpolation. What we're interested in is actually to uh, uh, do predictions. We want for a new input to know, for a new test input, right, to know what the output is. This is the objective, and you notice here, um, uh, it blows up, okay? So the question is, of course, you know, in the context of a Bayesian course, how are we gonna do this in a nice Bayesian way to automatically select this? Because this uh, uh, polynomial of order one, you're not gonna, if you have a, uh, something in, um, I'm sorry, this uh, 
uh, a polynomial of order up to nine, let's say, but it's in a scalar variable. So if I had 50 inputs, you're not going to be able to do this and see all suddenly it blows up, you know, let's uh, do this or that. So we need to have uh, some uh, nice way of um, figuring out basically what is the optimal way to do regression. Um, okay. So uh, I mentioned I was going to show you something with uh, uh, when you use this high order polynomial. Um, if you run this uh, code here, okay, you will see that the coefficients w that you get when you overfit, they all get very high values, and actually they're oscillatory. So one is, let's say, uh, plus a million, the other one minus a million, plus a million, minus three million, whatever. Uh, okay, so when, uh, and uh, if you change actually the error in the training data, even a little bit, you will see that these coefficients are very unstable. You will never get the same values. Okay, you will get uh, basically complete graphics. All right, but let's uh, try something uh, interesting. So in, uh, in, uh, in our um, uh, example up to now, right, uh, if I count the data, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So uh, I think there were, let's say, 10 data points. Okay, so we had 10 uh, data points. So if you try to do this experiment and you use 15 training points and you use a polynomial of order nine, the results doesn't look as bad. All right? So uh, effectively now, you can uh, tolerate the higher order polynomial because you have more data. And you say, wow, this is good. You know, it's all about having more data. If I have more data, then I can use as complex model as possible. Does that sound reasonable to you, basically, to adjust the complexity of your model based on how much data you have? The answer is no, right? I mean, the complexity of the problem is what it is, and you need to figure it out. It doesn't depend on what you observe. The complexity of the problem is this sinusoidal function. All right? It doesn't depend on having 15 data or uh, 5,000 data. So adjusting the complexity of your model to the observations, it's a very bad thing to do. OK? Uh, but obviously, there is an issue here, because when n increases, this issue with overfitting becomes less serious. And um, you can indeed see, right, that if you have 100 dat data points and you fit a polynomial of order 9, you get a fantastic solution. OK, so all right, so uh, we need to do something about that. Uh, so let me uh, uh, tell you to start with, right, this overfitting problem. Um, uh, it's the same problem when you use maximum likelihood estimates. As a matter of fact, uh, we will see, I will not do all the derivations, but this uh, least squares problem, it is actually identical to computing an MLE estimate for the parameters W. I mean, I haven't said anything probabilistic, but you know, if we use a Gaussian likelihood, you will see that the least squares problem is exactly the MLE estimate for the parameters W. So MLE estimate has exactly all the problems I described. So it's not good for you. OK? Um, So uh, what people do, right, before we discuss anything probabilistic, uh, so they look at this uh, um, training error, and what they do is they uh, regularize it, okay? You remember these coefficients w when you uh, had limited data that become very big numbers, very small numbers. So now it's on. All right. Um, I think somehow this is, is working, okay? Because one other day, my microphone was off and, you know, it picked me up well. I think I scream enough, right, that uh, they can hear me outside this room. Uh, so what they do is, in addition to this training, uh, this is a square error here, a uh, mean square error, they use a regularization term. Uh, this is not a penalty term, it's a regularization term. So lambda is a regularization parameter. And effectively, by having this term here is you say, look, minimize this error, find the W that minimizes the, this error, but at the same time, try to keep this parameters W in magnitude to be small. 
so not to become uh, infinite. Okay. So lambda, this regularization parameter, literally what it does is it controls the complexity of your model. Okay. It controls the complexity of the model. So if you repeat the optimization problem and you do, uh, um, you know, take derivatives with respect to its W, you set them equal to zero, and you solve this regularized this squares problem, you basically get the same equations as before, except the fact actually that on the diagonal of this matrix A, you have added this regularization term. I don't know if any of you has done this trick, right? If you have a matrix and you try to invert it and it's uh, ill-posed, you know, if you go in the diagonal and you add 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus 5, actually, you know, by miracle, you can invert it. Well, this is what regularization does. It doesn't mean it's good for you, but this is what the uh, thing does, okay? It basically stabilizes this matrix A, so this squares gives you uh, uh, an estimate of the parameters W that they don't explode, okay? And this is uh, what's called regularized this squares. Uh, I think I'm going to show you some results, but as I'm, and before I do the, the anything Bayesian, let me just say, uh, so what you do is you will get a point estimate, right? There's no statistics yet or anything like that. That point estimate with regularization, it will come to be the same uh, as the map estimate if I use a Gaussian prior and a Gaussian likelihood. So the point estimate that you get with regularized these squares will be the same, identical, as if you were doing a map estimation, finding the maximum of the posterior of W, where the likelihood and the prior are Gaussian. Okay? And we will see this uh, down the slides. Okay? So, uh, so in this problem, uh, with this very limited data that I had before, if I use a limit of regularization, the solution doesn't blow up and you get nice answers. Okay? I strongly, strongly encourage you to play with this program, assuming it works, still works, right? Uh, because you can put your own regularization or amount of data, and you can see these nice uh, pixels coming out of it. Um, now, uh, if you really use a lot of regularization, then you know what? Imagine if, uh, if this lambda is very big, okay, then effectively the only way to minimize this is for all the coefficients to become zero. Okay, so uh, you're going to get some very simple model, and in this case you can see you're actually getting like a straight line. Okay, so remember lambda, it's a parameter that uh, controls the complexity of the model. It's not a penalty number. When you do optimization, you penalize to achieve an additional objective. It's a, it's a, um, a, a regularization parameter. So I'm not going to tell you how you, uh, you find the best lambda, because this is not relevant to this course, but you know, in the literature there is, this is a huge area. In an ideal environment, it would have been nice to have a course just on that topic because it's related to inverse problems and design and, and many other good things, but don't have time for that, okay? Uh, and not only that, but the Bayesian way would be way better, and uh, so we don't really need to look backwards, we look forward. Okay. Uh, so if you use regularization, look what happens to the training uh, uh, error and the test error curves. And yeah, uh, so they, you remember before, right, they, the, the curves were looking very different without regularization. Now, uh, effectively, both they stabilize, okay, and, um, and, and effectively, uh, the, the, here, I don't have the order of the polynomial, so the order of the polynomial is fixed, but what you see here is the regularization parameter, okay? So, uh, let me just say something in case you decide to ever use this type of methods, right? There is no such a thing as a value of that parameter lambda. The problem should stabilize for a whole range of parameters. Let's say from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 7, the answers should be identical. If they vary with a little changes in lambda, there's a problem. All right, and you see here, this is a log of lambda for a huge range of the parameters. The results are identical. Okay? So this is what regularization does. Um, so lambda controls the complexity of the model. Okay. So uh, we're going to become Bayesian, uh, and we're going to start being Bayesian 
uh, from scratch again today, right? So we're going to assume that this parameter is uh, W that we were discussing on the linear regression problem. They're actually random variables because in Bayesian setting, everything is a random variable, okay? So uh, we obviously said we have some data, okay? And I denote this data as, as calligraphic D here. So in our regression problem, the data is xi times and xi and then the values of the function ti, okay? So the goal of a Bayesian uh, inference problem is to compute the posterior of the parameters. And you remember the posterior is the likelihood times the prior, and then on the denominator, had the marginal likelihood. Bayes rule, okay? Um, so, um, uh, a little bit of a parenthesis here, okay? I say the goal of Bayesian inference is to compute the parameters. No, that's not true. Nobody cares about the parameters. The objective in Bayesian setting is to do predictions, but somehow to do predictions for granite is posterior. But once somehow we do our calculations, we don't really care about W. W is sort of an intermediate variable for our main task, okay? We need to compute this posterior, but it's not the objective. The objective is for a new X to say what the output is, okay? This is what our objective is. Let me, uh, 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 so, in, in a Bayesian setting, right, because we treat W as a parameters, uh, as a random variable, you can, so remember our re regression problem, we said Y equal W0 plus W1X plus W2X squared, etc. okay? So if Ws are random variables, you know how many regression functions I have? Infinite. I have a distribution of regression functions because for each realization of these Ws, here is one regression function, here's another one, here's another one. So the variability that we will observe right, in our predictions, so when we compute error bars and things like that, is due to the fact that this W is a random variable. In classical statistics, when they plot variability in predictions, you know that variability comes, uh, 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 you know from where? Because the Ws are not random values. Where is the variability comes in classical statistics? Uh, and where is, well, I, everything is noise, but where is that noise coming? What is random that makes, basically, uh, produces the set of bars that you've seen in all statistics books? So, uh, observation error, so let me uh, 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 clarify it a little bit, right? So, that variability comes because you are looking, basically, the variability over the data space. So you say, if I use this data set, what will I get? If I use that, what will I get? Okay, so it's variability over data sets. Here, there's only one data set, that's what we use. The variability doesn't come from the data set. Completely different day and night sort of uh, uh, paradigms. So, uh, so our data set is fixed, it's given. There's no variability on it, none. It is what it is, okay? Uh, and uh, but W is a random variable, and this is the posterior of W. All right. Um, I I uh, so I, I so let me you know I mentioned already that the uh, MLE estimate is the same as least squares. Okay, but then we indicated uh, uh, all the problems of um, uh, of least squares. Okay, so. Um, so let me actually uh, show you this, okay? So you remember this, we, when uh, we did MLE for a Gaussian, right? We did MLE for a Gaussian. Let's say uh, we wanted to compute uh, the mean of the variance. So if you take, if you have a, a bunch of data set and you form the likelihood, and you take derivatives with respect to mu and sigma square of the log likelihood, because the algebra is simpler, then the estimates were looking like this, right? These are the MLE estimates. So these MLE estimates are coming by maximizing uh, the log likelihood. And because there are minus signs here, would you agree immediately with me that maximizing the log likelihood is the same as minimizing the square error? That's what we had in least squares. So MLE and least squares is the same thing. You see that? 
There is your uh, minimizing the square error, right? And here you have the log likelihood minus the, this error. So maximizing this is the same as minimizing that. So basically, an MLE estimate has all the deficiencies that we discussed uh, for these squares. And uh, we already said that uh, this is unbiased, this is biased. And uh, let me show you one picture that I threw, uh, as we have shown you this picture very early on, right? Uh, why these MLE estimates, in particular when you play with Gaussians, can be really terrible. Uh, so imagine you're trying to estimate a Gaussian uh, with MLE or with least squares, you know, the same problem, and you're given uh, two data points only, okay? So uh, I have three different cases. So in one case, the two data points are here, and now that they're there, and now that they're there. So this curve that you see here is the actual Gaussian from where the data points come, and this is the MLE estimate of the Gaussian. So basically, do MLE estimate of the parameters and fit into a Gaussian, put a Gaussian there. This is what you compute. And what you observe is, if you take the mean of the three Gaussians, it's practically the same as the mean of the true Gaussian. You agree? But look at the variance. The variance here, right? And there and there, practically the same. They completely, you completely underestimate the true variance. Okay, you completely underestimate the true variables. Uh, so, uh, MLE is not good for you. All right, so we're going to be fully Bayesian. Okay, uh, so this plot here that you see is uh, uh, very essential. I actually, I know we sort of did regression when we discussed about generalizing our models, and I told you don't panic because we will uh, redo the whole thing from uh, scratch. So, here is Input x, take it to be scalar to start with. Uh, the output t, and these are blue points are our data points. And what I'm going to do is, I am going for each x, in, in, I denote this here, let's say x0, I am going to uh, come up with uh, the prediction, but I'm going to make the prediction to be random, and in particular case, random coming from a Gaussian. So the function that I was telling you before with least squares, it would be actually the mean of that function, I mean of that uh, Gaussian. So at each point, right, my prediction will be coming from a Gaussian. This would be given x, this is what the distribution of y would be, okay? And the mean of that Gaussian, ah, the mean of that Gaussian would be this regression function that I had before, which is linear in W. So rather than trying to fit a model and say the response at this point is this, I'm going to say no, can be anywhere in this Gaussian because I'm not certain, hoping that that Gaussian will capture my confidence, my uncertainty in the prediction, okay? And I'm going to make the precision of that Gaussian defined by beta. And beta is going to be a parameter, a hyperparameter, which we don't know what it is, okay? Uh, hopefully we will find some method, maybe evidence, <laughs> right? To compute beta. All right. So, uh, so again, at, uh, this is the main prediction. This is what you see here, all right? And uh, uh, we fit a Gaussian at each point, okay? Uh, with this is the main function, and beta is the precision. So again, given the hyperparameters, so given w, if I knew w, if I knew this noise beta, at its location x, T follows a Gaussian that is given by this nice uh, equation. So uh, if T follows a Gaussian, uh, would you agree with me that the likelihood looks the way that I have it on the top? So if you give me n data points, and when I mean data points, I mean uh, xn and tn, uh, would you agree with me that this is the likelihood? If I knew the parameters. And remember, these observations are IID only given the parameters. This is very important. If the parameters are not given, basically, if you don't condition them, you cannot write this equation, okay? But given W, if I knew W, if I knew beta, this is how the likelihood looks like. Okay? So, uh, let's uh, take the log of this. Now, can we immediately see why the MLE estimate is identical to, again, to least squares for the regression problem. 
Because if I want to find W, right, by maximizing this log likelihood, because there's a minus sign there, what do I have to do is minimize this. That's my least squares problem. OK? That's my least squares problem. Uh, of course, here, if you do an MLE estimate in addition to computing W, you can also compute the MLE estimate of beta. I don't know if I have the formula. Yeah, actually, so you can see that the variance, it is actually the sample variance. OK? Uh, so you can compute uh, beta is the, the precision. So this is the variance. So if you take the with respect to beta, you get actually this formula as well. OK? So actually, what you can do, right, uh, if you don't want to be Bayesian, you say, look, you do MLE, you minimize this with respect to W and beta. And uh, so you, uh, you, you, know, you compute your W MLE, you compute your beta MLE, and you fix them. So if you want to do predictions, your predictions according to this plot is a Gaussian given W and beta. Where instead of arbitrary W and beta, you use VMLE estimates. This is what we call point estimates here. So you fix the parameters. You don't have to bother with them being random variables. And then your prediction follows a Gaussian okay, that is given like this. And it comes out that this is a very bad thing to do. Okay, This is a very bad thing to do. But you know. Uh, People think it's still probabilistic, you know, why not? Uh, but it's not a good thing to do. OK, so what we're going to do is we have, if we're going to become uh, Bayesian, right, and W is going to be a random variable, we have to put a prior on W. So the uh, obvious prior is a Gaussian cent centered around 0 and with some precision alpha. And what is alpha? To be computed. From where? Model evidence, eventually. OK? So the Gaussian uh, for W uh, looks like this, OK? And you remember, I, there is, this is to the power m over 2 because uh, I have uh, uh, mw. You remember from, um, I'm using here you know, uh, up to the mth order, all right? So I have m parameters w. So that's why you get that thing there. And uh, the posterior now of W given, uh, so uh, if you want the posterior of W given the data, um, the notation here, unless I have things uh, typed wrongly, when you see a capital, uh, I mean a bold X and a bold D, this is my data set, okay? The given data vectors, okay? So given the data and given the hyperparameters alpha and beta, which really they're not given, but if I knew them, the posterior of W is the likelihood times the prior. All right, and um, um, uh, can you tell me actually? So, this is the how the, the posterior is going to be, right? So, tell me what's going to happen when I multiply uh, this, all right, that looks like this, when I multiply it with this and I take logs. Look at the exponential terms again. When you multiply this and you have logs, you'll be adding terms, right? So one of the terms will be involving alpha over 2 times w transpose w, and the other term will actually involve this. So if you want to compute the maximum a posteriori estimate for the parameters, it is the same. Will you agree with me as minimizing this error function now? That comes multiplying the like times the prior. And what does this minimization of this reminds you? Regularize these squares. The only difference now here is that the regularization parameter has a physical meaning because it's the ratio of the precision of the prior, which is alpha, di divided by the precision, by the noise basically variable in your data. So immediately you can see actually indeed that this alpha in the prior plays the role of a uh, of, uh, uh, complexity control uh, variable in the overall model to be seen how it's going to be. But you can see if you're going to use a point estimate, effectively, um, it gives you the same thing as regularized least squares. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the prior. I am going to, uh, uh, th so this is my uh, likelihood. You notice uh, the product over uh, the points 
because they were Gaussian, becomes a summation in the exponential. And actually what I have done is, uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, using uh, uh, you know, uh, a regression function that is w transpose times x, I generalize it, right? And I say, how about instead of x and its location, I use some function of x, some basis functions. So basically, my regression function is not x transpose w, but is some function of x transpose w. This will allow me to use polynomials, radial basis functions, signs, anything. I mean, I can do anything I want to. So how about if I just put, instead of x there, put the function of x? Remember, this is still a linear regression problem, because when we say the regression function is linear, we don't mean in x, we mean in w. And in w, use a linear function. OK? All right. So this is the prior. This is the likelihood. You multiply them, all right? You basically add the terms in the exponential. And we need to come up with a posterior, OK? So, uh, so again, the, I'm sorry, this is the likelihood. Again, this is the likelihood. So we are going to multiply this. This here is expanded version of that. So we're going to multiply them uh, together. And uh, we're going to try to compute the posterior on W. And it's going to be a Gaussian, right? You multiply Gaussian with a Gaussian, you get a Gaussian. And to identify that Gaussian, what do we have to do? What's the trick? How do you come up from different terms with a Gaussian? Close the what? Square. The square. So basically, we have to find the terms w transpose w, and then the linear term in w, and from there extract the, the variance and the mean. So there is the answer. And uh, let me see if I can, it's on clearly written on the next slide. So the answer is that the posterior of w is given by a Gaussian. Uh, I should actually put the sequel. It, don't have, it doesn't have to be proportional, right? So this is equal, it's normalized. It's a Gaussian that has this variance, all right? And uh, this, uh, the mean is uh, uh, this uh, noise precision beta times this SN times summation of the function values at the data training data points times the function values there. So um, it looks very complicated, right? But you know, you appreciate the fact that, uh, uh, you know, so SN involves uh, what I call the design metrics. You remember I, I referred to it. Uh, when you put all the data together, you know, in like each data point in a row, uh, in our case, what we do is actually each data point involves this functions phi, okay? So when, this is a matrix, okay? So this is actually what's called the design matrix, okay? Uh, so, so the posterior is a Gaussian, okay? All right, and um, um, I'm actually, I, I'm giving, I think, uh, let me see what, if this is what it is. So you remember, you know, uh, I, to derive this, I told you we close the square. There is another rapid way to do it without ever bothering to close the square, and that is to use these formulas for linear systems, okay? So basically, you remember these equations, uh, if you know p of x to be a Gaussian, you know p of y given x, you can actually uh, reverse here, and you can also compute ex exactly p of y, and you can compute p of x given y. And effectively, uh, this is what we have to do here, OK? Uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but basically, you can immediately identify that uh, the likelihood times the prior, uh, the calculation looks like this, OK? And you basically have to inverse this to get the posterior uh, so you can actually literally say uh, mu in my problem is equal to that, lambda is equal to that, a equal to that, etc. Then read the formula, and there is the answer. Okay. So these are very handy formulas for linear Gaussian models. Uh, okay. So, uh, but we're not done because in uh, in a Bayesian setting, nobody cares about uh, nobody cares about w, right? What we care is about the prediction. So the notation here is the following. Capital, bold X, bold TR by data, training data. Now, once I have trained the model I need for a, a new point X, this is unbold X, 
to know what the prediction is. To do this, you remember the general formula for the predictive distribution, it's really the likelihood given the parameters W times the posterior of W. All right? And again, you know what? Linear Gaussian systems, because uh, what form has the likelihood is linear, uh, I mean, is Gaussian, and what form has the posterior we just computed is also a Gaussian. So when you put the whole thing together, it comes out that the predictive distribution is a Gaussian that has a mean and a variance that they are functions of the location x you are looking and the formulas for uh, the variance and the mean are given are given here. Okay? Uh, again, the formulas look complicated. You really need to do them once to convince yourselves that you understand how to manipulate these formulas with uh, linear systems. Literally, the formulas you need is uh, what is given here, okay? Uh, so you look, you multiply two distributions like that, you can find the marginal or you can do Baker's rule and invert and you can just read the formulas. And what you get is, you get uh, these nice formulas. And what is nice now and very appealing is, the, the, you notice that the variance uh, in your predictive distribution is a function of the location. So you anticipate if you're far away from data, your uncertainty will be very high if you're close to data points, right? Hopefully the uncertainty will be small. And um, I'm going to show you a schematic how it looks like. But this is sort of uh, uh, for the problem that we had before, uh, where we had a polynomial, all right? So I'm telling you what these functions are. OK, I'm writing them explicitly. So I define uh, this uh, vector phi here for each point xn is, is given here. This is the transpose, um, and um, you know, all right, and uh, everything else is uh, self-explained uh, in the equations. And here is how the results look like. So uh, let's revisit them. The blue lines are the training data points. Okay. Uh, this uh, I don't know what color is this. I'm color blind. You know, is that yellow? Green. All right. So that green thing is this, uh, the sign that generates the data. We don't know what you know from where it comes, but here we generate the data using the sign and then putting some noise. Uh, now this curve, you know what it is? This curve, what it is? It's the mean of the predictive distribution. Uh, what is, where is the mean of the predictive? There it is. M of x. Okay? And, uh, and what are those things? So for each location, we evaluate this, right? This is plus minus one standard deviation of what distribution? Of the predictive distribution. So it's plus minus s for each location x. OK? And um, um, I mean, here, maybe this is not the best ideal example because I use m equal to 9. Uh, but you notice the, uh, the error bars somehow uh, they look to be about the same everywhere, OK? So hopefully, I'm going to have a picture to convince you that the, uh, if you are away from data, I mean, the data here sort of are uniformly distributed in the domain. So if you have more data, let's say, on, on, on the left, then on the right, you will see the error bars basically blowing up. Uh, to get this uh, uh, thing working, you notice everything here depends on alpha and beta. So I, I do all these calculations uh, by fixing alpha and beta, which actually it's illegal because we don't really know what alpha and beta is. Okay? So we're going to learn uh, how to compute uh, the optimal alpha and beta by maximizing the evidence. All right. Um, so uh, let me talk a little bit about um, uh, model selection. Okay? And I think uh, you have to do a little homework problem that most probably didn't mean anything. I don't know if it was homework one or uh, homework two. You have to do, uh, uh, I gave you a criterion for one of the homeworks to select a model. What was that? This one? Two. Two. Okay. All right. So let me just tell you first, uh, if you're non-Bayesian, how, you know, so, you know, you know, you, how do you do basically model selection? And the key buzzword is cross-validation. So imagine that this is all your data set that you have. 
So what you do is you split it, let's say, in four pieces. And uh, you're going to train your model using the white uh, data. And then you're going to test it on uh, this data set to see how well it performs. And then you're going to repeat it where you uh, use this, this, and that as your training data. You test it on this. All right? So this is what's called s fold cross-validation. Uh, s, in this case, is equal to 4. OK? So the idea here is you use part of the data, all right? And then you do predictions on the rest and evaluate sort of the average that way. Um, in, um, um, if you have, let's say, n data points, uh, uh, it's very common to actually uh, uh, keep only one data point out of the training. And, and this is the, what's called leave one out cross-validation. Okay. Now, you know, if you have a data set of 10,000 points, leaving one out and trying to do this on average, it's going to kill you. All right? It's not good. Uh, but this is basically the traditional way of doing cross-validation. And sort of you need to know because even in a Bayesian setting, some people uh, do cross-validation to, to verify the results. So the, I think this is what you did in the homework too, right? Nope. Okay. Similar to that. Similar to that. OK, uh, so when I say uh, selection of the model complexity, in our case, the model complexity is what's the order of the polynomial, right? What is the order of uh, M? And uh, the criterion, the most simple criterion, uh, which is what's called here the Akaiki information criterion, AIC, you notice uh, you're, trying, you're trying basically to compute W, all right? Uh, that uh, maximizes the, uh, the log likelihood, but has a minus m there, all right? And the term minus m, you know what it says? Yes, maximize the likelihood, uh, but keep m, keep m as, because as a mi if you maximize this, you know, what, what values of m are you going to get? Because it's minus m, as small as possible. So effectively, the idea here is that um, this criteria favors simple models, OK? And, and uh, it comes out, actually, that that paradigm that simple models are, are better than more complex models, it's also the Bayesian way, all right? So uh, don't uh, extrapolate to say, oh, I'm going to use a very complex model and you know, be the best in the world. No, the best models are the simplest models, and we will see this uh, in examples uh, when um, uh, we walk, work through this, uh, the many of these slides uh, this and next week. Actually, uh, so because we have three more minutes, and I see these uh, general slides here, um, what we're going to do is, is something weird, right? So we, we, so we did Bayesian regression for, let's say, different orders of polynomials in the regression function. So uh, think of little m representing a different model. So m equal to 1 can be only two parameters, m equal to 2, three parameters in the polynomial. What we can actually do is we can compute the posterior over model. We can compute the posterior over model. Right? This is very important, right? that we have random variables, and now we have a posterior over models. And what is the posterior over models giving a data set B? is basically the likelihood for computed for each model M times some prior for each model times some normalization factor. And literally, what you can do is you can say, find me the model M that maximizes this posterior. I mean, the idea is find me the model that best explains the data, right? The one that has the highest posterior best explains the data. And effectively, what you need to do is you need to do this uh, Vegas rule for models, all right? Now, you may say, but where are the parameter W here? Can you tell me? I don't see the Ws because in our model, everything's based on Ws. So where are the Ws here? Integrate it out, right? So we integrated the Ws out. 
So we, yes, we do need all the previous calculations, but W is completely integrated out. So basically, this is the, you know, you can see, for example, if you want to calculate the likelihood for model M, uh, the only way to calculate the likelihood is given the parameters, all right? And then basically, you're going to have to use uh, a prior uh, of the parameters for each model M. Right? You remember this, this uh, marginal likelihood is the denominator in Vegas rule, right? So it's the likelihood times the prior, and uh, they're all referring to a model M. And what is interesting here, you can actually, when you compare models with this equation, the number of the parameters on each model don't have to be the same. So you can think one model that uh, you use polynomials, and another model that uses radial basis functions or sines or cosines, right? Uh, so even that theta vector is different from one model to another. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay? So this will allow you to actually compare even models that have a completely different origin. So actually one model can have one parameter, another model a thousand parameters. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. So, all right, so uh, uh, we're going to come back uh, starting from the slides, okay? Uh, but let me just finish, okay, uh, with a statement of the Sokam uh, razor principle. One should pick the simplest model that adequately explains the data, okay? So what we will actually conclude from uh, the different criteria is basically that the simplest model that explains the data is the best model, okay? Uh, and uh, so complexity is uh, uh, not the answer, okay? And so we will see in a Bayesian way how this thing uh, is coming up. All right, so we will uh, continue the slides. Do me a favor, read those slides so that you know what I'm talking next uh, uh, Thursday.